I'm Tommy Thomas. I want to welcome you back to the show, How to Beat the Odds. we got a special show today. You've seen Don Dickerman, who has the deliverance ministry, on our show about three times now. We've done three different shows with Don Dickerman. One was with uh, David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. Another with Mark Chapman, who murdered John Lennon. We've done several shows about deliverance and how people are bound up by demons and the powers of darkness, and they influence these people into doing a lot of things that they do to end up breaking the law. Well, today, Lori Kellogg is in prison in New York. ABC made a movie, Lies of the Heart. You may have seen it. They've aired it quite a few times on television. Well, she's in that prison, and Don Dickerman was up there ministering about 10 years ago in that prison, and she came up and talked to him about the powers of darkness. They got a relationship. They became friends. He began to minister to her. It's an awesome testimony. And right now, I'm going to roll in just a little footage. I want you to see what she's like right now, what she has to say for just a minute or so, and then we'll introduce Don Dickerman. We're rolling that in right now. I was my neighbor's neighbor. Mm -hmm. I was everybody's everything, but I lost sight of being me. I, mm -hmm. I was only something if I was a part of someone else. Um, I was only a good girl. I was only acceptable if I was doing something for somebody else. You felt some emptiness, lost. I'm sure. Yes. Empty, lost, alone. Mm -hmm. Didn't know how to, how to change it, how to correct it. Yeah. Felt that I was trapped. Yeah. I lived in a little box and the person inside of me, the person that I knew I could be, the child of God that I was meant to, to know that I could be, mm -hmm. was locked up tight mm -hmm. by all these self-made prisons, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in prison for a long time. I spent 10 years in prison. My entire adult life I've been imprisoned in yes. one way or another. Yeah. And I told myself that I could, I could handle this because it happened all around me. My best friends, he beat her, mm. she called the police, he beat her twice as bad. I wasn't going to call the police because I knew what the results were. Um, all the other marriages around the neighborhood were breaking up because the women didn't do what was necessary to make their husbands happy. Mm. My marriage wasn't going to break up. I'd make it survive. I'd survive mm. my marriage to make my marriage survive. It was, it was such a vicious cycle. Now that you've seen that footage and you see what Lori Kellogg looks like and you heard what she had to say, I want you to meet Don Dickerman because he can enlighten us about what happened to her and what's going on in her life right now. So let's meet Don Dickerman once again. Hey, Don, welcome to the show. Thank you, brother. It's good to be here. Well, we were talking, you gave me some footage of her that you had taken up there and we're gonna roll in some more later on and show about some of the abuse and all in her right. life. But how did you meet her? Well. Uh, I, I've been preaching in prisons uh, since 1974, and uh, I've, I've been in many, many prisons. And I was preaching in uh, the prison where Laurie is, the Bedford Hills Correctional Institute in uh, Bedford Hills, New York. I didn't lo know Laurie at the time, but uh, I, in, in the message, uh, I mentioned something about the occult, something about demons, and I, I'm not sure what all I said. But she came up to me after the service. I'd actually prayed for her for her healing in the service and not knowing who she was. Uh, she had a, a hearing problem and uh, that was from some of the abuse she had experienced in her marriage. But uh, Lori told me a little bit about her involvement with the occult and as a teenager, a little bit about uh, her abuse as a, as a child growing up. Uh, she was born in New York City. Uh, I think maybe at the age of two or three, her family moved to Massachusetts and. She was uh, raised in a Catholic home, uh, but not really knowing anything uh, ab about the Lord Jesus and about salvation and so on. Uh, and uh, her, her parents eventually divorced, but she had already experienced at that time sexual abuse. Uh, uh, she had seen spousal abuse from her father to her mother and uh, experienced a lot of trauma in her young life. Then uh, her, her mom eventually remarried uh, to a Methodist and she said for the first time in her life she was exposed to the gospel as far as it being preached and Jesus presented. Uh, but eventually uh, that marriage uh, didn't last too long uh, and uh, Laurie was uh, pretty much uh, on her own by age 15, 16. 
And she told me she'd been involved with uh, some people that were uh, into animal sacrifices and uh, pretty much occult activity. But before uh, she got to the point of being involved in the actual ceremonies, the family moved again, and uh, that's when she eventually met her husband, Bruce Kellogg. And uh, that's, the, that's pretty much the story of how Lori wound up in prison. Uh, Bruce Kellogg uh, was eventually murdered, and Lori was charged with uh, uh, the crime, was uh, sentenced and found guilty, uh, and, and is doing now a 25-year-to-life sentence in, in that New York prison. And uh, that was in 1992 when she was sentenced. And what's interesting about her situation is uh, they lived in Pennsylvania. The crime took place in New York. And so some of the, some of the evidence that maybe could have been admitted about her, her life and her abuse was not admitted. And uh, it, it's a pretty involved story. Uh, but uh, Lori, I, I guess what I can say about Lori uh, right now is I know her to be genuine in her, uh, in her Christianity. Uh, she's, she's not a bitter person. Uh, she's forgiven. Uh, she, she's thankful for her two children and uh, the life that she has. But uh, she's probably one of the most uh, abused ladies I've ever met in prison, and most of, of the ladies in prison do come from a life of abuse. Uh, but Laurie's was, uh, was pretty severe. I remember that she was like just about 17, I mean 16 and a half, 17. He was like 34 years old. Right. He, I think he was uh, 15, 16 years older than she was. Uh, uh, during, during the process of time, me knowing Laurie and a little bit about her case of People have written to me wanting to help her, help her get a new trial and so on. But uh, her, her husband's uh, ex-girlfriend is one of those people who contacted me and uh, she told me of the abuse she experienced when she, when she dated this man. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, the abuse was real. Uh, but Laura experienced, uh, her, her husband uh, sodomized her, raped her, uh, beat her, caused a couple of miscarriages by beating her when she was pregnant because he didn't want to have children. He wouldn't allow her to go to church, uh, wouldn't allow the name Jesus to be spoken in the home. Uh, actually uh, uh, sexually abused her with a, a 41 caliber pistol. Uh, a 41 caliber pistol? Yeah. Well, we have a roll in where she talks about that. Let's let her talk about right. that and we can hear it firsthand. Okay. We're going to roll that in. We'll be right back. The gun that he used to, to frighten me was a true source of intimidation. It's the same gun that he used to rape and sodomize me and cause some of the internal damage that my doctor never had a chance to testify to. Hmm. It's the same gun that the young man who killed my husband stole from my home. It seemed I never failed to have any trouble coming up with a story as to why this, these For your bruises. your friends and neighbors. And... I tripped down the stairs more times and yeah. slipped over toys and fell in the bathtub and, and got into more wrestling matches with the kids where I got the worst of it than you could imagine. I mean, there was always a reason, mm -hmm. and he never had anything to do with it. He was never even there. I can't believe I, I, I went to such extremes to protect him. Mm. Well, you, but you did love him. I, I, with all my heart, yeah. with all my heart, this was, I made a commitment to this man when I first met him, but mm -hmm. long before we were ever married, that this was my husband. Mm -hmm until death do us part for yeah. the rest of my life, I would love him and honor yeah. him and obey him. Well, that role is powerful, Don. That shows one of the th some of the things that she went through. She really was abused, but you also told me that the people that knew about the abuse, the neighbors and people like that, never came to testify at her trial. Well, uh, it's not because they, they didn't want to. Uh, uh, the, the best I know, and this is from Laurie's testimony, I, I haven't uh, spoken with judges or attorneys right. or anything like that, but 
Uh, Laurie said uh, pretty much the judge told her, uh, Miss Kellogg, uh, your husband's not on trial, you are. And so he didn't allow testimony from uh, doctors that treated her in the emergency rooms, wouldn't allow testimonies of the neighbors of the abuse and so on. Uh, it pretty much said that this trial is about you, it's not about him. So the abuse was never really considered uh, in the trial. And uh, I, I think if it, if it had been, the outcome would have been different. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I think I could say that without question. People that have seen the, the movie, Lies of the Heart, uh, uh, they, they're all sympathetic with Lori. Uh, and uh, she doesn't justify uh, her situation. Uh, as a matter of fact, she says, I think I probably still love the man. But she did experience, hor uh, experience horrible abuse and threats, and her children were abused. And the way the, the, the crime took place is that uh, her husband had a, a fishing cabin up at the Finger Lakes in New York, and I'm not sure which one of those lakes, but somewhere in New York, across the Pennsylvania border. Uh, some of Laurie's uh, friends, who were actually younger than, than her husband, because Laurie was much younger, uh, had uh, babysat for for the for them, and uh, they found out uh, that he had not only abused Laurie, but he had, had abused some of the babysitters. And the news kind of spread to the friends, and they were um, they were trying to get Laurie to leave and for her safety. But her husband was uh, apparently such a threatening person that he had had. Uh, neighbors watching to call if uh, anything unusual was happening. Laurie tried to leave, had actually loaded their uh, vehicle to leave, and he came home, found out about it, and there were, there were more beatings. Uh, but uh, eventually, he went to this cabin uh, for a weekend retreat, and uh, Laurie and three or four others, I'm not sure how many were, I think there were four in the car, including Laurie, drove to this cabin uh, after dark, um, and I'm not sure what the intentions were. I think the intentions were for them to confront him about abusing uh, the two girlfriends involved as, as babysitters. But uh, one of the men, uh, uh, first name Denver, he's still in prison and actually confessed to pulling the trigger, had taken the very gun that uh, Laurie had stuck in her mouth and in her private areas in, during violence. Um, that same gun, he had taken it from the house. And uh, Laurie says when they pulled up to the cabin that two of the, the, the boyfriend, Denver, and his girlfriend went into the cabin and just matter-of-factly shot him as he slept. Um, eventually, it went to trial, and Laurie was charged with uh, conspiring and 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 I, I don't know the details of all the charges, but um, that's pretty much how it all took place. Uh, incredible story. And uh, Laurie's a, a picture today of, uh, I guess you'd say, somebody coming through uh, terrible uh, abuse and trauma and not having the, the bitterness that a lot of people would. Uh, but she... Um, She's a, a tender young lady, loves the Lord. She's a model inmate. Uh, if I guess if anybody is a non-threat to society, it, it would be Laurie Kellogg. Uh, you know what people say, so, well, why would all that happen? Why would you just leave? And there are several things when she talks about that. I'm going to roll those in. Okay. And you'll hear her talk about why she just didn't leave him. And, and this is so true in so many cases where people are abused. We'll be right back after the roll-in. I had a loaded gun, a 41 Magnum, 41 caliber Magnum, with an 11 and a quarter inch, 11 and three quarter inch barrel put in my mouth, held by my hair, asked if I thought he was going to pull the trigger. Obviously, I shook my head, yes. He told me, no, I'm not going to pull the trigger, but if you ever try to leave me again, I will hunt you down like a dog. Hmm. I will find you, I will beat you within an inch of your life. And while you lay there bleeding, and 
unable to speak or do anything about it, I will beat those two brats. He used um, <laughs> some vulgarity. Those two little brats that you gave me to death in front of your very eyes. And once I've killed them, if you're lucky, I'll waste 35 cents, put a bullet in your head, and put you out of my misery. Mm. Now try to leave me again. So had, had you talked with your mom about this, uh, about the abuse? Did, was she aware of it? No, Don. I wish I had, because I know now that my parents would have done more to help me out of this. I lied to my parents. I kept the truth from them, mm -hmm. because I felt that these beatings were a failure on my part. Yeah. I felt that I was not being a good wife, because my husband had to beat me. If he was angry at me, it was because I had done something yeah. wrong or not done something right. Yeah. And I didn't want my parents to know I was a failure. I left home at 16 to be with this man, and I felt, as he told me, that I'd made my bed and now I had to lie in it. He told me I couldn't hmm. return home, they wouldn't take me back, and I believed him. So I felt that I couldn't go to them because he had me totally convinced they wouldn't be there for me. And I believed this man. I was such a fool. I was mm. such a fool. Well, you saw in that roll in that when people are really bound up in demons and the powers of darkness and abusive relationships, you say, well, why don't they just leave? Well, sometimes they're powerless to leave. And that's hard to understand sometimes, isn't it? Well, yeah, and I, th I think what uh, Laurie or any, a lot of people in those situations is they don't know where to go and they don't know how to leave. Uh, there's, um, there's a lot of intimidation involved. In, you know, I, I, I think about this, Tommy. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about uh, child abuse. It, it doesn't mention a lot. Uh, Jesus did address it uh, when he said, they, you know, woe unto those that, that would cause offenses to children. The millstone said, around yeah. the neck. Uh, he talked about that, but there's not a lot of situations. I was thinking about Moses. Uh, he was raised in a pagan home, and uh, I don't know what kind of abuse, but he had, he had a, lot of, uh, a lot of wrong teachings and uh, and probably thought his life was uh, was over and wasted when he was 80 years old on the back side of the desert uh, you know but but God had a plan and a, and a purpose for him and uh, in, in Laurie's situation I think I see it all the time in the area of deliverance people come to me the story of their life is childhood abuse and uh, what happens is the abuser uh, already has demons, that's, that's why they're abusive. And the one that's receiving the abuse generally gets demons through that trauma. And it's a, it's a horrible situation. I, I see it, uh, I, I would say, almost daily. But in the women's prisons, uh, I'm not sure you can find a woman that had not been abused uh, and that wound up in prison. You deal with this in deliverance all the time. All, all the time. And, uh, it, it is a doorway. Any, people that are watching this right now, uh, I, I don't want this to sound like it's an excuse for, for your life to be messed up, but if a person has experienced sexual childhood, uh, physical, verbal abuse, it's almost certain that demons came as a result of that and are working now in that person's life in the area of torment. And uh, they, need, they deserve to be free from that. And the freedom process is not complicated. Uh, the, 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 uh, I guess the obvious thing is it needs to be confessed to God. Uh, I, have, I have a message I call admit it and quit it, but it basically means that you confess it to God. I, ne I need uh, to put this under the blood. I need to get free from this. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on it anymore. Uh, the past is, is just that, it's just past, it's gone. And so uh, we see that, I see it in, in, in Laurie's life. Uh, she would say the occult and those kind of things probably open doors for demons, but uh, more than anything, it, it's usually the ancestry and the, the traumas that they experience. Uh, with those things comes uh, generally bitterness and unforgiveness and, and uh, hatred and resentment and all the things we know by, by, uh, by terminology they're generally the source of demons that have come through uh, abusive situations. And people, people deserve, God's people deserve to be free from that. Absolutely. Uh, 
Jesus, uh, uh, not, he not only paid for our sins, but he took our wounds. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the bruises that we get in life uh, sometimes can be so traumatic we, we don't know how to get loose from them. Uh, but deliverance is a real process. Uh, we do it all the time, and it's not like most people think. Uh, Hollywood's given deliverance of, of black eye, but also preachers have made it to be something that it's really not. Uh, I always call it a truth encounter. Uh, it, you encounter the, what, what has happened in a person's life, what they've experienced. Uh, you, you encounter those lies with the truth of God's Word. And when a person refuses to believe the lies of Satan and chooses to counter that with the truth of God's word, um, that's, that's where the victories come. And uh, we, we command demons to leave. It's not, not an option. It's not like, a, you know, it'd be nice if you'd leave. <laughs> but, but in the name of Jesus Christ, that right. demon either has legal rights to be there or he doesn't. And once those legal rights have been confessed, we have absolute authority in the name of Jesus Christ to command demon spirits to leave. And they always do. We see... Uh, you see healings and oh, deliverance? Yeah. People get free? Yeah, all the time healing. Uh, a lady today that I ministered to earlier today had uh, a problem called restless leg syndrome. I had that. I had it for, uh, I don't know. What most, exactly is that? Your legs uh, won't let you rest, uh, won't let you sleep. They, they move, they twitch, they jump. They, uh, if anybody's got it, I don't have to describe it. They, they know, they know they got it. But I found it to be demonic. And uh, I don't have that problem anymore. I haven't had it in uh, 10, 12 years. I mean, it's just gone. But we see that happen all the time. We see people healed of that. We see people healed of all kinds of sicknesses because the source is the demon. And once you deal with the source and get rid of it, uh, the healing can come that's already paid for. Al already uh, the price has been paid, you know. And so, yeah, we, we see that uh, all the time and see it with excitement, you know. Here people yeah. give their testimonies months later and years later, and I don't have this problem anymore. Uh, well, that's what Jesus did. And in Lori's case, I, I don't know uh, about her physical uh, problems that were caused by demons. I know she got a broken jaw from a, a fist. I know she had miscarriages from a fist in the stomach and being kicked in the stomach. Uh, she wears a hearing aid today because of some of the, the physical abuse she had. I don't know how much of that, how many demons came in and caused physical infirmities, but what I do know about Lori's life is she's free from the bitterness and the anger and the resentment and the, the vengeance and all the things that she could that a lot of times accompany that she's yeah. free from that she has peace and uh, she has it in a way when you look in her eyes uh, you can see it you, you can know see it. the yeah. peace and the joy yeah and when um, when she hugs you you can almost feel like uh, you can feel the the freedom in her I don't know how to explain that except it's a it's communicated well there's people watching this show right now that need to get free and I'm going to put your website up and all in your books and everything, and they can go there and learn more about deliverance. Right. But I'd like for you to just pray for the folks watching. Look I will. I'll, I'll pray for you now. And, and I'd like for the people that, that uh, are watching to, to join with me in this prayer in that you already know any areas you may have of torment, uh, whether it's nightmares or bitterness or whatever. You, you know what they are. Uh, you speak to those things as I, as I pray for you. In, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind every demon power who has no right, no legal rights to be in any believer's life. I bind you now in Jesus Christ's name. I command you to leave these people and I loose the healing mercies of the Lord Jesus into these lives. Uh, every, every life that's watching, I loose the Holy Spirit of God into your life now and uh, receive uh, with you in the name of Jesus the healing mercies from the, the flow of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don, thank you for coming back on the yes, show, Thomas. man. You know, whenever Don comes on the show, I get excited because people get free. Every time he's been on the show, we've had more calls from the times that he's been our guest on the show than any other shows. 
People need to get free. And they don't understand that they're bound up a whole lot of times, that the powers of darkness are real, that demons are real, and they have to go when you say in Jesus' name, as long as they no longer have permission. Yes. They have permission because of doors that have been opened, but you can close those doors. Go to his website. There's a prayer you can pray that'll set you free from generational curses from every door that's been opened. You can pray that prayer and get free. And then you can take the name of Jesus and tell him to get out. Amen. No more. You've had enough. Yeah. Anyway, I want to encourage you to go to his website. I want to thank you for watching our show. Let us know if God ministered to you. I know he did. So give us a call here at How to Beat the Oz. My wife and I would love to pray for you. There's a number at the end of the show. Or you can go to our website, howtobeattheodds.com. Thanks again for watching our show. We'll see you next time on How to Beat the Odds. Dad, I'm, I'm incarcerated. I'm in a maximum security facility for women. And I experience more freedom every day of my life in here than I experienced when I was home and mm -hmm. free and married. Right. And because then I knew the bonds of oppression, depression, mm -hmm. anger, fear. Fear. Um, Your self -image. Because I didn't know the joy of the Lord.